And it's our delight for this fourth installment of the seminar series um, to welcome Dr. Ellen Adams, Senior Lecturer in Classical Art and Archaeology at King's College London. Uh, in fact, um, our last speaker, um, Arlene Holmes Henderson, is also from King's College London. Um, I should point out, contrary to maybe an impression I gave in the advertising for this event, this is not the official launch um, of Ellen's forthcoming book, but rather uh, a foretaste of her new book, um, which I shared. Um, hopefully, you can see somewhere I shared the cover of the book. I'm sure she'll show us as part of her presentation. Um, the new book, um, Disability Studies in the Classical Body, The Forgotten Other, which is due out from Rutledge just about any day now, but perhaps more on that later. Ellen originally trained as an Aegean prehistorian with a PhD on Minoan Crete from Cambridge. Um, she still researches and teaches it and runs the ICS Mycenaean seminars and has done field work in Britain, Greece, Bulgaria, and Cyprus. And before Kings had postdocs at Athens, at the BSA, and at Dublin, um, at Trinity College. Um, but more recently, Ellen has devoted much of her research to exploring how people with sensory impairments, especially deaf and blind or partially sighted, interact with art and artifacts in museums, with some experimental events in museums too. And her work on disability has impacted practitioners, begun to impact practitioners and users through the Mansell Project, and that's the acronym for Museums Access Network for Sensory Impairments London. Um, the L in Mansell, London, um, explains why it's not part and parcel of the Year Museum, of which I curate, which is sitting behind me virtually, of course. Um, anyway, but it, art it arches across 20 or so London-based museums who share practice information and ideas. Um, very shortly, when I um, turn over to Ellen Adams, I'm going to turn off my video and microphone and beg you to do the same if you haven't already done so while we're listening to Ellen, so we can give her all the bandwidth. Um, but I encourage you to put your comments and questions either in the chat or better yet, to save them up till after the presentation, when I'll welcome you to turn your microphone and video back on to speak to us. And I should warn you, um, I'm getting better at this all the time. Um, this is being recorded. I'm gonna record Ellen's presentation. Um, and um, sometimes I'm um, not very good at remembering to turn off at the end. Um, so just in case, if anyone has any objections to being recorded, um, please tell me or remind me to turn it off or, or whatever. Okay, so without further ado, um, I'm delighted to turn over to Ellen Adams. Thank you, Ellen. Well, thank you, Amy. Um, thank you all um, also for this really kind invitation to um, speak at your departmental um, seminar, but also more widely as well i'm just going to share my screen um so right yes uh um as amy uh said this isn't the uh book launch um you're gonna have to sort of shout if you uh can't hear me of those because i can't see the chat by the way so please don't hesitate to um let me know um, it actually came out on Friday uh, to unroll, and I don't have a, a an actual real copy to um, wave in front of you because um, mine hasn't come yet, but um, um, it, I don't think it's going to be real until it does. Um, I've, I've sort of talked a lot about my museum project in various different online um, forums, and I'm aware that uh, there's a problem here in, in that, you know, people can see... Uh, or listen to talks um, across the country very easily. So um, I thought this time, because it does kind of mark um, the book actually coming out and existing uh, for real, um, I thought it might be quite good to kind of take a step back and um, explain some of the background, some of the reasoning, having the and then um, uh, the, the resulting book. Um, so this isn't a book launch as such, but I did want to outline some of the sort of more moral and personal reasons for uh, talking about disability and furthermore folding disability studies into classics. And usually I want to focus on the kind of intellectual benefits, the, the academic results 
uh, from doing this, but I, I sort of want to indulge myself in unpacking uh, why it's really important um, anyway. Um, so disability is a significant uh, minority in the W Health World Organize, um W Health Organization, who suggested that around 15% of um, all populations are um, disabled or registered disabled. We'll come to defining disability later on. Uh, to put that into perspective, the last known UK British uh, census, which is now 2011, 14% of the British population um, self-identified as non-white or, or a category other than white. So it's a very, uh, it's a very similar um, significant minority, if you like. And furthermore, you know, I feel quite uncomfortable saying uh, non-white because that just means like othering and, and grouping everyone together. We know that uh, even the term BAME is a bit uh, rather problematic. It's the same with disability. It's a useful term to categorise um, people who um, kind of go into this category who may otherwise have absolutely nothing else um, in common. So it's a useful uh, definition. It's a necessary uh, label, but it's very much an umbrella one. Um, I think I think that, that that actually matters quite a lot. Um, so. So what I'm going to do today, starting off uh, with um, with what we're doing, is, is to uh, think about what is disability, uh, and, and uh, turn our microphones off. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, so what is disability studies? Because I mean, I have to say some really good work's been done on thinking about disabled people in the ancient world. And I sort of name check um, Christian Lay's particular here. He's brought out lots of volumes that uh, kind of divide different impairments and study them and collecting all of the data, all of the evidence we've got for them. Disability studies is a, is a rather different thing. It's a modern discipline. And it is um, a discipline that um, originated, stems from um, activism, um, for, uh, but it comes from the desire to get rid of disability discrimination. And it um, you know, really was spearheaded. America led the way on this and UK has always sort of followed about five years behind. Um, so basically, I, I, uh, one point I would also make is that this is a uh, human rights civil issue, it's a civil rights issue, but it's kind of lagging a generation behind gender and um, ethnicity or race. Um, and basically what um, uh, people were attempting to do with this activism was to defeat, was to fight against ableism and disableism. Um, just like, you know, racism is, is, a, is a term that's coined when people wanted to uh, push back against that. Um, these are two different terms that I think sort of best explain by comparing them uh, with the patriarchy, ableism, um, so this being uh, the really powerful assumption that um, about normalcy and the default able-bodied person. So uh, when you're um, when you're kind of devising a research project or something, the, the human you've got in mind uh, that you're you're studying um, is kind of fully functioning, as it were. Disableism is um, uh, more like misogyny. If ableism is like um, patriarchy. Disabled is more like um, misogyny. This is just how I use the terms anyway. It's a much more actively hostile um, attitude towards uh, disabled people. And it actually sort of involves the exclusion, discrimination um, against them or um, us. Um, the term disabledism makes me makes me smile because um, until very recently, it's always had that little red squiggly line underneath it when I've been using um, things like Facebook or um, Microsoft Word. Microsoft Word has sorted this out in the latest update in 2020. But this says a lot, I think, that the system wasn't recognising this as a word. That means, you know, as a concept, it's not one that's uh, really in popular uh, discourse. But things are changing and things are changing very quickly. 
um, you know, I've, I've seen quite a lot in my lifetime um, in terms of um, progress. Um, and that is um, a lot to do with um, legislation, which I'm a big fan of. Um, in Britain, five years after the American um, version, uh, we got the 1995 Disability Discrimination Act, and that got absorbed into the 2010 Equality Act. And this is really, really, really important because disabled people at this point, um, they developed, they, they were given human rights. So before that point, we did have legislation that kind of protected disabled people, but the sense was more of charity. There's sort of, um, oh, we're, we're giving this thing to you because um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a nice thing to do and we're nice people, so we're going to give you some support. From two, 1995 in various areas, it became a right. So it wasn't someone's gift to give, it was their duty to give. And this actually made a massive change in terms of expectations um, and so on. So long actually, um, so massive that it's still kind of filtering through. I don't think people quite realise how powerful the um, legislation is. Um, this is a common uh, uh, mantra for uh, dis dis disability activists, nothing about us without us. And this basically means um, please don't sort us out. Um, please don't. It basically means please listen to us um, when we're asking um, for support. Uh, don't decide on our behalf what we need. Um, and if you look at the history of how disabled people have been treated, education, workplace, all different spheres of life, it's able-bodied people deciding they know what's best. And um, this has been compared in some very interesting work with um, uh, colonial views, this idea of white man's burden and kind of uh, deciding that, you know, uh, what's best for another group. Um, so that that's um, quite a sort of powerful um, um, message. But talking about um, uh, colonisation, um, what disability studies, well, how it originated, you probably have noticed from, you know, America and UK at the top there, is a very Western framing of uh, disability studies. And some really good work is now happening um, from um, Global South and um, other uh, such uh, countries is saying actually uh, we think of disability in a different way and we're addressing it in a different way and can you not sort of take over the uh, conversation another aspect of decolonizing um, that, that's happening at the moment in the book I, I personally and most of the contributors um, focus on uh, the British um, context actually and this is this is quite possibly going to uh, be a criticism of the book, but I did actually uh, do this quite deliberately because I think um, it does vary very much across the um, globe. So focusing on a particular region is kind of more honest. So what, what, what I'm not going to do, even though the title is very broad, it, it, it could be interpreted as being global. I'm not claiming uh, to speak for the world. It, it, it's, a, it's a local um, response. Um, so let's look at this, this quote from uh, Linton claiming disability, which I, I rather like. Although the so-called reflected disciplines such as philosophy, literature, rhetoric, art and history, note that these are all sort of founding stones of, um, of classics, these disciplines evoke disability everywhere. They seem unable to reflect on it. It appears in treaties on the ravages of war, aesthetic theories that expound on perfect form, metaphors dripping with disability imagery, modernist notions of progress, and artistic representation of animalous bodies. Yet outside the disability studies literature, it is barely unpacked. Disability has become then like the guest invited to a party, but never introduced. Um, and I, I like this um, uh, quote very much because it certainly, uh, I, I think, makes the case very strongly for um, incorporating disability into um, all of the uh, themes that you might be thinking of. Um, but the point here um, to do with disability studies is that um, 
not the case that we should we should kind of take disability studies and impose it on classics. That would be anachronistic. That would be highly problematic. But I think we can turn to disability studies for the tools for uh, really um, thinking about disability in uh, the ancient world. Um, you know, it gives us the means for doing this unpacking that this quotation uh, talks about. Um, another point about the, the sort of local response to um, disability studies, is this is a point made by Tom Shakespeare, who's um, one of the leading uh, disability uh, studies experts. And he makes a point that in you think that American Britain quite often can be kind of lumped together. But there's a very big difference in that in America, uh, American scholars of disability studies tend to be lo located within the humanities. So thinking about, for example, disability in film or something like that, whereas British experts are generally placed in the social sciences. And they're dealing uh, with empirical evidence, lived experience, policy, things like that. And one consequence of this split has been the lack of engagement, perhaps, with disability issues in the British um, humanities. Um, OK, so what is disability? Um, and I'll say it again, uh, as a term, it's it's an absolute mess. The, the modern term is just a kind of... Um, uh, um, it's a tool needed for social policy on this um, very diverse group of people. A huge number of different types of impairments, mobility, leap, learning, sensory, communication, mental, cosmetic disfigurement, chronic illness, um, including pain, which I would count as um, disability. Um, so there's the type of impairment that you have and then there's the grade of impairment how severe it is and this matters a lot and in British law you're um, only registered uh, or you're able, only able to claim protection as um, a disabled person if you reach a certain threshold uh, so mild or even moderate impairments uh, wouldn't necessarily give you that uh, protection um, so it's the it's this sort of um, degree of the impairment and it's also the impact that the impairment has on your life. And if you have to sort of uh, go through the various processes of um, getting disability support, um, it's not enough just to produce a piece of paper as a sort of doctor's note. You have to normally um, go into some detail about uh, the impact, um, create a kind of rather negative narrative about um, you know what 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 adverse um, effect the impairments had um, um, on your on your life you probably can't tell from my speech but I'm um, registered deaf I, I'm I do uh, um, uh, count as disabled um, myself so I have quite a lot of personal uh, experience of going through uh, these uh, hoops this is the British legal definition of disability. It's a physical or mental impairment which has a substantial and long term adverse effect on your ability to carry out normal day to day activities. It's all very negative sounding and it is, you know, indeed, um, you have to really emphasise the negative. Um, so it's interesting in this day and age that many um, activists and um, disabled groups are promoting a celebration of disability, which doesn't, you know, if, you, if you're actually in that lived um, experience, um, makes a lot of sense to sort of kind of balance out the um, overall, um, yeah, negativity. Um, so it's a very problematic term in the modern era, and it's, it's one that's in flux, it's always changing. Um, and I, I would really like it if people um, in, in the media and everyday life when they then they're talking about disability or a disabled person to automatically qualify what they mean by that because it doesn't to my mind make any sense uh, if you just describe someone as uh, disabled um, it's a term that's always in flux if you think for example um, Silverman's um, fantastic history of the diagnosis of autism um, and how this has changed uh, dramatically. And it's still an ongoing process of understanding uh, this uh, condition, how varied it is. Terminology is very, very important. 
um, in terms of understanding conditions and also shaping policy as well. So it does matter to spend time thinking about uh, the the um, naming of things. In one example, again, in my lifetime, I've seen um, mental health illness being taken much more seriously today. And I think that probably goes hand in hand with some of the rather more unpleasant uh, terms that were used, you know, in the in the playground when I was young, like uh, nutter and loonly, they are now, you know, uh, not uh, considered um, viable everyday um, discourse. And it, it, it does it does matter, I think, because if you're dismissive um, or derogatory um, and you use terms like this, basically your society is going to fund uh, investigating and researching that um, uh, condition much less. You think if you compare uh, mental health funding with um, cancer funding, for example, um, um, that, that's that probably the uh, terminology has contributed at least to that. Um, so it's not the case that we have this really nice, easy to use, clear cut modern term um, that shouldn't be applied to the past because they didn't have an equivalent. Our term is um, um, just um, there for convenience when you're um, when you're thinking about organising demographics and 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 supporting people and so on. Um, and this, I mean, I've had some really interesting discussions with people who say actually we can't um, really study disabled people in the past because uh, there's just not that much evidence about them, and we certainly can't fold disability uh, studies into um, the ancient um, world because they didn't have anything like it. It would be completely anachronistic. And I think my first um, kind of response to that is that the modern terminology, if you have to go for the processes of um, um, uh, getting the support mechanisms, you really begin to understand how slippery and messy the modern uh, term is. Um, so the term basically is is always uh, problematic. We're, we're very difficult. Um, Rosemary Garland Thompson, for example, she says that uh, disability is an overarching and in some ways artificial category. And I, I do see what she means by that, but we still need it for social policy and for funding and for um, things like that. So what can we do uh, when looking back at the past? Um, and um, with an awful lot of caution, retrospective diagnoses is something that has happened, um, something that, you know, an approach that people have taken. Um, this is, um, a, I think there's a consensus today that this should not be the um, end goal of any study, like, um, deciding uh, what condition Claudius may or may not have had, uh, that, that in itself is, is uh, unhelpful. But I do think with a, a lot of caution, it's useful to um, have a good um, understanding of, of modern um, um, kind of medical understanding. And um, there are a couple of examples in, in the volume um, that do this, I think, I think, you know, cautiously, enough. So um, Baker and Francis's paper, they um, they use very rough retrospective uh, diagnosis to provide a loose analytical framework for reconstructing past experiences. Um, and um, Hall in her paper uh, uses this to interpret, it, interpret um, representation. So I wouldn't chuck the baby out with the uh, bathwater on this. It's a useful tool, I think. Um, and we can also look at representations of disability, and this is something that um, uh, there are uh, many uh, studies of. Um, and this is this is you know a, a, a tempting approach because um, disabled people in the past didn't have much of a voice. You know we don't have that much literature, and uh, you know it sort of goes with the uh, condition. It seems I, you know there isn't much um, actual um, agency. Uh, that seems to be coming through. Um, and this is where it, it can be quite useful, I think, to um, compare disability with other uh, minority or disadvantaged groups. Um, like women, for example, they didn't have 
much of a voice in the ancient world either. Um, and one way uh, to explore them has been uh, thinking about how they've been represented in literature and art. So can this also be um, applied to disabled people? Um, yes, I, I think so. But again, with lots and lots of caveats. Um, so, um, you know, just as women may well be the objects of the male gaze in a sexualized way, the disabled body is often the object of a sometimes medical stare. Um, and again, Rosemary Garland Thompson has, has, has talked a lot about this. This stare conveys a detached clinical response to the disabled individual rather than providing insights into their experiences. Um, so these are pretty big caveats, I think, to um, bear in mind. One big theme in the book um, that you kind of see in all the individual chapters, but it's dealt with very differently, is this tension between representation and reality. Um, I think I think that there's some very interesting comparisons to be drawn out with with the balancing of these two um, areas. Um, and um, also, this is uh, perhaps uh, moving into slightly more um, controversial territory, uh, not just looking at uh, disabled people in the past, but looking at how um, disabled people in the present engage with um, antiquities and so on. And this is where we're, we're going into my museum uh, project, which is um, engaging with um, blind and partially sighted people using audio description and touch tours and also um, engaging with um, capital D deaf people um, who use British Sign Language which um, I know myself but it's not my first language I'm not grassroots uh, deaf at all um, so um, so this is this is a, another way of uh, folding in disability studies uh, into classics um, and I, I mean, another uh, um, issue is, is or, or why I think um, taking a moment to see what disability studies have to offer is that it, it does highlight some pretty big assumptions that are made in the humanities and especially perhaps in uh, classics, which is kind of uh, the most traditional, um, the heart of the uh, humanities, if you like, the, the sort of uh, first um, um, historically um, and this is this idea of academic excellence being um, uh, you know the, the the perfect body and mind um, everything just being um, absolutely fully functioning and you know um, above and beyond in fact that doesn't leave much room necessarily for um, uh, bodies that don't uh, function in that uh, particular sort of absolutely uh, no impairments, no um, 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 issues whatsoever, which I think is pretty rare at the end of the day. Um, but it, it doesn't actually uh, take note that um, excellence can be achieved in all sorts of different ways. And I, I sort of single out sensory studies since I'm mostly talking about uh, sensory impairments um, uh, because that's closest to home. Very, very common for um, it to be assumed that the senses are all kind of there and furthermore that they're well functioning in the same way which uh, is, is absolutely not true I mean we do know that um, medically I'm not going to dwell too much on this because I suspect that anyone who's had anything to do with uh, disability studies will be would have had this sort of you know um, um, uh, well um, uh, well be well absorbed in the difference between the medical and the social model but just in case you're not, the medical model is uh, the focus on uh, the impairment, the biological, um, neurological uh, condition that is bringing about uh, the, the issues that you have. And the medical model um, is furthermore looking um, very much at how medicine attempts to fix this um, um, issue to sort of bring you in line with normality or able-bodied uh, condition. So the focus is, I suppose, on uh, the loss of what you have. So I don't have uh, over half my hearing um, and this uh, particular model will focus on that and sort of try to figure out on, you know, the best hearing aids, the best strategies for um, um, 
getting over this. The social model is uh, something that was pushed through by um, activists. Um, and this is this kind of flips things um, on its head because it says that, you know, there's nothing wrong with that individual uh, with an impairment. They're fine. It's normal to have impairments. Uh, we can cope with that. But the social environment is making things difficult for them. So society needs to change in order to accommodate these individuals. Um, so this is a, a massive difficulty, a difference. Um, it's where um, the human rights um, aspect uh, comes into uh, much more uh, thoroughly. Um, I think, I think in general, uh, because historically these have been set out, been very much either or. You know, you've got to choose your camp and sort of take your bag to it and, and sort of settle there and not move. I think these days people realise that uh, most of uh, life as, as you know, someone with a significant impairment is a, is a balance between the two. And I read um, uh, British law on uh, on this kind of balancing act between the two. On the one hand, uh, you are uh, entitled to certain uh, medical fixes uh, like hearing aids and so on. On the other hand, um, there is an obligation, there is a duty for certain environments uh, to change as well. It's it's kind of both they come together in this phase, um, reasonable adjustment. Um, so not only does it bug me a bit that we have to kind of separate medical and social and choose one when uh, that's not actually my uh, lived reality. I think it misses out on um, something else as well. And this is um, the other worlds so appealing to other worlds, appealing for uh, divine interaction, uh, so-called ritual module ritual model um, um, or whatever you want to call it. I think you can see this uh, very much in the ancient world with uh, the uh, dedications, with the votives, uh, with the uh, appeals to the god. Um, and I think it's something that, that happens in the uh, modern world as well. Um, one other thing about the uh, social model, um, there has been um, in previous scholarship, there has been um, an argument that in the ancient world, they only had the social model and uh, they didn't, you know, the medical model, this idea of fixing people didn't exist at all. Um, I personally um, am not convinced by this. I'm, I don't agree with that. I think there's lots of evidence for uh, medical instruments, for, um, you know, people, doctors, uh, going in and attempting to make things right. Um, so I, I think in the ancient world, they also had a mixture um, of the two as well. But that, that's something that, um, you know, there is a debate about. Um, classical legacy, and I, I think that thinking about classical reception and how that might link the ancient world and disability disability studies um, could be useful, this sort of triangulation between the three, um, i.e., you know, what assumptions do we have about disability and um, is classics to blame um, or is this legacy partly to blame? Um, disabled people are subhuman. I think we can definitely see that in the ancient world. And I think that's kind of um, something that that possibly um, or, or many people have argued is, is something part of the legacy, part of the inheritance. Um, also disabled people as superhuman as well. Um, so um, I think it's, it's Ogden was uh, writing about archaic tyrants who very often were depicted as being deformed or having a disability. Um, so part of their um, achievement was overcoming these barriers and, uh, you know, being um, even better than the average normal um, individual. Um, we, we have this, I think, a little bit in the um, Paralympians um, you know, and everything they achieve. And I am a, a massive fan of the Paralympics. Um, but I think uh, that there's something called inspiration porn where people get a little bit gushy over um, um, sort of um, overcome by uh, what they see disabled people doing. Um, and uh, that there's something not quite right about this narrative of um um, um, well, inspiration porn, I think, is, is probably a good term to use for it. Um, so I think, you know, especially with the subhuman, uh, what, what these two, um, subhuman and superhuman, what both of them aren't 
is normal. So there was this sort of subnormal or supernormal, if you like. Um, so you've got this sort of able body at the norm, and then you've got lesser things wrong with them, and you know, something you know, almost semi-divine, absolutely um heroic um above them. And um this um I think is is something that is um um and, and possibly um I'm still mulling this over, but possibly. Um, an aspect of negative reception where, you know, we have this legacy from the ancient world that's possibly not helpful in terms of uh, the activism and uh, progressiveness. Um, and also what we see in uh, coming through from the ancient world um, is the use of ancient authorities to uh, perpetuate um, um, a, kind of, a kind of myth, an idea of impairments and disabilities in both disability and medical literature. You would be amazed at how often medics, like proper hardcore medics, start off a paper um, alluding to something that Aristotle said, for example. It happens a lot. I've read up um, on, on um, hearing and um, uh, deafness and so on. And, you know, 100% medics will start off with this throwaway remark on uh, what um, Aristotle said. And I, you know, you, you could easily not notice, but it is actually um, extraordinary that this happens, I think. Um, and sometimes this happens in a way that is unhelpful. Um, um, you know, things that, that um, we don't, you know, Aristotle's got this authority and um, it could be, um, uh, misinterpreted. Sometimes there's some actual mistranslations of what the original says and so on. Um, so, yes, uh, unpacking this legacy is a crucial part of challenging our own cultural prejudices. Um, I, I do actually honestly believe that. I think it's, it's, it's quite important to um, uh, do this work. Um, I mentioned normal before and, and what on earth is normal and who wants to be normal? Um, so um, before I talk to these two images, um, I think I think um, I think one thing that. Um, oh, I've just noticed time. I'm going to have to uh, get a move on. Um, I think normal today is typical. Covid-19 has uh, brought the role of data management state oversight, citizen tracking and so on in public health to uh, global headlines. And a lot of the science of um, data collecting in uh, public health um, is looking for the typical, looking for the pathological, the atypical. Um, and um, what, what people are uh, sort of looking for, what people are hoping to achieve is some sort of flat, um, uh, almost boring uh, normal, if you like. Um, it is normal, however, for societies to have a disabled population. There's absolutely nothing abnormal about um, there being uh, disabled people in your midst. And I think this is something uh, that the activist, activists um, before me, um, I'm, I wouldn't really describe myself as an activist, but this is the message that they did so well in uh, pushing through that um, it is uh, per perfectly part in, of um, part of uh, normal experience um, in a society to have this going on. And in fact, unless you die rather young, uh, you are very. It's very very normal to experience um, a disability at some point. Um, it is also, um, but, but there's there's a kind of uh, a, a clash, I think, between this this normal and the classical ideal, the body beautiful, which I mean, I'm a big fan of. It's it's one of the things that drew me into classics. Um, it's still a very very important um, um, motif, and you know, it's just um, a wonderful thing to uh, study. It's also a very powerful. Um, motif and I think um, you know I can go to something like the 2015 British Museum exhibition on defining beauty the body in ancient Greek art um, which I really enjoyed um, but that, that, that this is an ideal which is um, um, a kind of at the opposite end of um, the uh, lived experience of, of um, uh, what I was thinking about and I think maybe there's been overemphasis on uh, 
this ideal, which you know by the actual name of it, is is sort of unachievable. That that's a representation that 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 kind of doesn't uh, sing to uh, lived experience. Um, there there has been. I mean, if you think of Beth Cohen's uh, "Not the Classical Ideal." This focused on ethnicity and gender. It didn't really get to uh, disability. So I think there's you know, more uh, room to be thinking about that. Now, you've got a couple of images in front of you. One is the Venus de Milo on the left and Mark Quinn's Alison Lapper Pregnant on the right. And Mark Quinn uh, was very much inspired by uh, classical uh, statues and uh, particularly uh, the Venus um, and you can see the obvious uh, similarities. The Venus is an ideal, uh, she is perfect beauty um, and uh, you know aspiration um, but of course she's um, uh, quite badly broken, she is damaged um, and um, you know not as uh, she's meant to be. But as Alison Lapper who um, uh, is literally on a pedestal here and the uh, uh, fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square in real life is uh, not considered to be an ideal. And in fact, is is considered, I mean, um, things are changing really, really quickly, but many people would look at her and say that she's sort of incomplete. Um, there is less of her than there should be. And there isn't, there's, um, you know, 100% Alison Lapper going on there. They're, they're, that's That's all. Uh, she is exactly, um, uh, ha you know, as she is. It's the Venus who is uh, broken. Mary Duffy is another uh, uh, character to bring in here. She's a, an artist and uh, she um, doesn't have arms in the same way as um, Alison Lapper, uh, doesn't have got similar uh, bodies. And she um, uses her own body to make a similar point regarding uh, the Venus here. Um, and uh, Need's work on uh, studying this um, has pointed out that Duffy's body is whole, complete and self-bonded. Um, so uh, Duffy is not less of a person due to these missing parts, um, which is, is, is something that uh, still people will kind of uh, um, um, think. Um, challenging ableism in academia, and I think um, the best way to do this is to um, work with disability, to work with disabled groups and try and come up with some really interesting uh, studies that persuade people that um, continuing to just forget that this happens, that this is part of life, uh, isn't enriching the discipline, that it's better. Uh, that Disability is really, really interesting. Um, the body is very interesting when it isn't quite behaving as one might expect, it becomes really fascinating. So um, I think I think there's a, a lot we can um, um, do with this. So just moving slightly to explain um, my project, which I, I presented elsewhere quite a lot, so I don't want to focus on here. It's set in museums, it incorporates disability studies into antiquities. Um, it's thinking about how the classical legacy is uh, shaping our understanding of how our senses work, focusing on sensory impairments and prejudices about them. Um, so, for example, the idea of the viewer being, uh, you know, having 2020 vision. And in classics, um, I think uh, there's a lot of fascinating work on uh, the viewer has been done from different perspectives. So. Um, not necessarily the male viewer, also the female viewer, thinking about um, the view from um, a slave, thinking about, you know, children's views. So um, the viewer has always, um, I think, uh, been considered to be a, a sort of male, able-bodied, elite, uh, free um, adult. And, you know, people have sort of been looking at uh, different ways of going about this. But also um, we can think about... Um, people who see things literally differently. Um, and it's very, very rare for a blind person to have no sight. It's very, very rare. So about 4% of blind people have nothing uh, to work with. So um, it, they're very much uh, seeing differently. And spoken language is the only valid, valid mode of uh, communication. But if you do uh, know BSL or A sign language to a certain level, um, it is very eye-opening to um, how uh, to other ways of communicating, which which I'll come to in a moment. 
So thinking about ableism through museum practice, working with people with sensory impairment, um, um, and thinking about um, uh, the, um, the, the the kind of um, uh, strategies that people have come with come up with um, audio description touch tours British Sign Language tours um, and this is I love the Royal National Institute of the Blind's uh, motive is see differently um, which is again you can see the influence of um, the um, activists there to the extent that there is uh, there's is something called deaf gain uh, blind gain actually celebrating uh, these different ways of being. It's, it's quite important for um, kind of uh, mental health, especially if you have to go through these processes of, um, um, you know, describing um, all the problems you have, all of the barriers and so on, uh, to turn around and say, actually, it, it's not so bad. British Sign Language is brilliant. Um, blind partially sighted people, and I've, I've worked with them in the British Museum um, with uh, for general courses and events and so on. Um, they tend to be extremely good at looking and sometimes uh, better than sighted people because they uh, really know how to focus. And um, there are some fascinating different ways of seeing stereos stereoscopy, uh, where you uh, this is the depth of field you see. And some people don't have any. Um, they literally see the world in two dimensions. Audio description is fantastic for everyone and I think you know it's, it's something that museums can open up for, for the mainstream users and um, everyone wants to touch things so British Sign Language um, I'm not going to have much time to go into what British Sign Language is but just to make the point that um, it's a visual spatial language and it is a language it's got a grammar uh, it takes years to learn um, but when you're communicating about art using this it's just it's it's a more direct way of doing it in fact switching back to spoken English the sort of straight jacket goes on it's so linear have to do one word at a time and you're not using space um, and there's a lot there's a very strong performative element uh, visual vernacular it's called in uh, sign language as well elements of mime it's not of course mime but it does have um, elements I'm not going to dwell on this. Uh, Teresia's project is something that the um, the British Museum did in 1998, and the recently uh, the the late uh, Ian Jenkins was very much involved in this. And um, 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 it, it's a project that's it's out of date now, but um, uh, really is very very interesting to uh, think about. Reasons for using um, audio description in, um, I'm sorry, I'm going over time because I think I was given 15 minutes. So Amy, if you if you want me to speed up, I can't of course see anyone. Um, just No, 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 that's fine. Keep going, please, Ellen. Okay. Very interesting. I am not be because I know, I know I'm, yes, I, I get carried away. But um, audio description, AD, um, you know, it's been said a bit that using AD techniques for the description of static images and exhibitions not only enhances accessibility, but it also helps to develop more expressive, vivid and imaginative museum tools. Uh, a recent study has argued that AD can guide sighted people, help them engage with artworks and increase memorability. M memorability. So you actually kind of get uh, absorb you you get drawn into the artwork um, much more thoroughly it's even been said that AD might become part of visual studies and you know could it um, would art history be um, open to that um, idea I don't know turning to the BSL side I did a few I, I, I've done a few um, oh, um, uh, events in uh, museums, done two in the British Museum, which uh, generated over uh, 60 forms, um, where uh, what we did, there were pop-up events, and um, the idea was that this was um, a mainstream general public, um, so not an access um, event for uh, people with um, in, uh, sensory impairments, but there was um, audio description made available, touch tours were made available and uh, British Sign Language uh, deaf tour guide with a voiceover interpreter were there to do um, an introduction to some of the stories of the myths and so on. Um, so the idea was that these were for hearing people to um, actually 
get a tour from a deaf person, it's flipping everything around. Because what's supposed to happen in access is that the uh, disabled person gets given uh, the provision from the able-bodied person, and this was um, uh, turning everything on its head. Um, and um, the feedback was um, really interesting. Self-selecting, obviously only people engaged with this if they were you know, open to the idea uh, to start off with, but people did like the interactive uh, physicality of uh, BSL, the visual dimension, um, actually really, I suppose the mime elements really uh, helped um, bring the story to life. Uh, spatial dimension, um, multi-perspective viewpoints, you can do zooming in BSL, you can kind of, you know, describe a building in front of you and then you can like yourself go into it, you can sort of start entering it and things like that, it's very difficult to explain. Uh, but when um, someone's doing that and it's being explained to you um, in um, uh, because you've got the voiceover happening, um, that was kind of um, um, interesting to people. And, and one um, uh, visitor says, you see the world with different eyes. Um, so this is this is a good opportunity to spread awareness, but also uh, to give disabled people a kind of uh, the agency to, to, to just sort of be in charge of the um, event and uh, teach uh, people um, other things. And it, it's not just a wordy thing to do. People really were seeing and experiencing the um, artifacts. This is all in the um, Parthenon galleries. Um, oh, I forgot to mention that. Um, so that's the slightly weak uh, classical link. Um, but it is a very good ca case study for um, setting this. Um, the, what is uh, British Sign Language? It's a visual language. Um, so uh, you do have quite a lot of isonicity, that is drink. Uh, role shift where uh, you can become different characters and things and institutions and even concepts in a story or a narrative. And you flip between the two. Um, you can zoom in and out. The perspective can fly about all over the place. Um, and it's also a spatial language. This is your canvas. Um, you can reproduce a scene in front of you. You can um, describe something, park it there, go and talk something about that. And that's still hovering. You can come back to it and link it into uh, the the um, story. You've got spatial verbs, which are much more uh, dramatic. Um, and you can uh, kind of um, illustrate abstract concepts and so on. It's a really good language to use for talking about art and so on. Um, I don't think it's going to take off because it's very expensive and very, very time consuming to learn BSL. But um, it's, it's interesting for me anyway to um, think about. OK, we, we are coming to the end. Um, I want to end with um, um, a collaboration I'm doing with um, Historic Environment Scotland which manages to have absolutely nothing to do with uh, classics. But up in Scotland, um, it's, um, you know, obviously there's, um, uh, it, they've got their own laws up there up to a point, and they have passed the uh, 2015 BSL Scotland Act, which um, gives public bodies a duty to promote BSL as well as kind of supporting it or tolerating it. Um, even so they, they are rather more progressive up there and um, um, what I have um, been doing with them is taking this idea of the pop-ups that we've been doing uh, down here in London uh, to help promote uh, BSL um, and we were going to do uh, an event last summer and guess what it got uh, postponed or um, actually cancelled in the end um, but what we're going to do now is set up, this is, it's set in Hollywood Park, um, a few, not many, but a um, few QR codes in various parts of the uh, park where people can um, get a link to um, um, a, a deaf poet um, who will be doing good stories, one of the, uh, oh, I think someone's got their mic. Um, so um, and and that will be um, also online. Um, and so that will be another way that they can actually promote this. Um, and as, as it would be digital, it would be online. We'll be able to do sort of language notes explaining how the language is uh, working as well. So actually, it's much better than a one off uh, event that it was going to be quite an expensive thing to put on. So possibly the, the only positive to come out of uh, COVID uh, there. 
Um, so, so getting back to a book that was out on um, uh, Friday, um, and um, I, I believe that where the introduction is going to be made freely available um, at some point to give you some uh, sense of, of what we're doing. But there's four different parts, and they're all introduced. Um, um, the first is um, about patient voice, I guess. It's this whole thing from the activists of, you know, who sets the agenda, who actually decides how we're going to manage this situation. And this tension uh, between medic and uh, patient or uh, disabled person and uh, society. Um, and what, what's happened in this book is there's an attempt to kind of uh, pair um, uh, people from different discipli disciplines up. So um, in this part, there's someone from um, a couple of people from um, medical humanities um, and a classicist has been paired up together. Um, and then in part two, it's the um, thinking about the support mechanisms that are sort of similar to what I've been talking about before, but also uh, for aesthetics. Um, and then part three is uh, thinking about um, it's more archaeological, uh, set in uh, one paper is in uh, sanctuaries, one is um, in the burial sphere. Um, I'm thinking about sort of like archaeological, so actual bodies and also um, the landscape, the, the uh, more phenomenological approach to um, moving through uh, space um, as someone with a, a disability. And part four is um, the argument I've, been, I've made before that, that I think you can do this triangulation. I think you can sort of make classics and disability um be friends if you like if you do it through the prism of um uh, classical reception if you think about the legacy if you think about you know why are we studying classics you know what 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 what's the um uh, what's the point i guess um so um yeah th this is the contents which i won't uh, dwell on because i am over time Nothing about us without us. I, just one thing to say. I mean, I, I've, I've made the point of, of saying that, you know, I'm, I'm, I have lived experience of this and, and the the actual um, kind of um, barriers that get put, put up um, being disabled. There's absolutely no reason whatsoever why an able bodied person can't study disability. And there's really um, not suggesting that uh, you have to have lived experience, partly because um, it's such a messy category. I mean, I have no lived experience of using a wheelchair or um, all sorts of, you know, huge number of other conditions. So it's not as though if you tick the box, that's it. You're an authority and no one else can talk about it. But this is really, really important. I do think if you're going to do disability in the ancient world, you need to look to disability studies to find out what people are saying about it with that lived experience. Defining disability, um, it's so slippery um but there you go we had a go thinking about how people are treated i think it says a lot about society how it treats uh people with significant um you know bodily and mental uh conditions that they are uh, um, uh dealing with this tension between the medical and the uh, social model uh normality is a word that needs to be treated very carefully um it's normal for some people to have a disability and it's fine. And I think we, we've kind of lost sight of that um, in recent decades or centuries uh, in, in the West. Um, it, it's, it's jarred for a long time. It's gone a little bit beyond jarring. I think that um, the, the complete absence, the complete forgetting uh, that, that um, people are moving through the world did in the past and are in the present um, with these conditions. I think I think the the time um, is up for um, uh, these these assumptions um, being made. Uh, talked just very little bit about Twizier's project and and things I've been doing in the um, Parthenon galleries, but really trying in the project not to. I know decolonizing the curriculum is the buzzword. It's it's an odd term um, and we're all supposed to be burning things down and so on. I, I don't want to burn everything down, partly because I think all the human rights would be burnt down with it. I'm, I'm uh, very happy to work with the status quo, but I think um, it's very important to um, uh, look at these different perspectives. 
and realise how interesting they are. That, you know, it's not not doing it just because it's the right thing to do and it's a worthy thing to do and a moral thing to do, but because it's really enriching. It's part of the human condition um, and beholding or viewing or whatever you want to do. You know, if you're an archaeologist or an art historian, um, this relationship with the object, I think people with sensory impairments um, have uh, quite a lot to um, offer. Also something in this project, um, if you're an academic in a university, you may well have a collaboration with um, um, a curator uh, who, and you know, they might have quite similar backgrounds. They might have done PhD in the same place and then gone off to a museum. You've gone off into a uh, university. Um, what's much less common, I would say, is uh, collaborating with um, access staff. And that's been one of the uh, most brilliant parts of this project. Um, very uh, bright, thoughtful uh, bunch of people. And um, it's it's just been, um, um, selfishly, it's just been absolutely uh, fascinating. So on uh, that note, ah, nearly on that um, note, sorry, I haven't quite finished. I did want to say that this, this book um, uh, comes from a conference and, um, Jessica Hughes very kindly organised a kind of podcast of the conference and you can listen to that at Classics Confidential uh, on this link and there's also a bit more about my project um, on the link above www.mansill.uk 